Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me here. My name is Haya Don. I'm the founder and president and CEO of Fusino Resources. I'm a mining engineer, Namibian born, been in the industry for 30 years. Um, I think what's unique is I really have been on all sides of the table. I've built mines, operated mines, um, been on project finance on the debt side, been on the equity side, then I became an entrepreneur. And I have successfully raised money and built and sold companies. Um, a couple of incredible M&A success stories with us, you know, looking to do that again. Hey, yeah. Welcome to London. Thank you. It's now, great we've, to be here. We've never met in person, so it's, it's great from it that feels perspective. Feels like we have, but it feels like a, I know some pretty detailed conversations over, over the over the years. Look, um, you're here in London for a, a conference. Obviously, is it kind of is it African focused or what, what's what's the no? The theme is actually Mining Journal Select, yeah. and they've got a system or a framework how they select quality companies. Right. It's quite good, and they selected us as a quality developer and invited us here to present. So it's worldwide, but it's their own selection. Okay, okay, fantastic. And you're obviously here to meet investors and, and, and walk the streets, meeting some of the shareholders as well. So um, what do you, what's the message you're kind of getting over to them? Yeah, so we have a key objective here, which is to expose ourselves much more to the London audience, because we've always been a very Canadian-focused company being listed on the TSXV. We have not done much marketing at all actually in London, and we feel now that the project is getting into construction very soon. Yeah. Uh, we need UK-based investors, guys that understand Africa and understand Namibia, and that's why we're here. Right, okay, now you've been doing all of this. You've explained your background, and you've got Ross Beattie in the, in the background as well with you, shareholder. You been doing this in the background in the context of a very difficult precious metals market, okay? It has not been fun on the equity side, despite what the price of the, uh, the commodities are doing to operate. You put a PFS out last September. I think it was a kind of shrug of shoulders from the market, like everything, every other bit of news that came out. Um, but you move forward. You advance. You're aiming for a DFS when? May? June? Yes. That's sort of time End of May, June, yes. Right, okay. So I've got to ask the question. One, it was, I think it's quite brave to put out a, a, an economic study in, in that backdrop, but it has allowed you to move forward. Inflation was a massive issue last year. Are you starting to see the benefits of some of that coming off? Yes, definitely. You asked a couple of things, so let me go back. So it is true, we have fast-tracked um, with the conviction and the depth of experience and knowledge that we have. We knew since discovery in 2019 that this project was for real. That's why we said, regardless what the market thinks, we've got to progress this as fast as we can. We thought that's the path to value. That's why in three years we've taken basically drilled it out studies and we um, about to put out a definitive feasibility study which we need for project financing. Um, what the beauty of a definitive feasibility study, of course, is, is much more detailed estimates, capital estimates, which brings me to your question on inflation. Um, so pleasingly, we are seeing a certainly a leveling off, and in some respects, even a slight reversion to mean in terms of some of the inputs into that capital estimate. The estimate is being prepared right now, so I haven't got the final numbers, but certainly uh, mechanical equipment seems to be flatlining or maybe even going down a bit. Right. Um, oil prices have come off a bit. So the pressure is not the same anymore as it was um, nine months ago when we, actually six months ago, when we concluded the pre-feasibility study. So that's very pleasing, so I think with a bit of luck, will deliver a definitive study that's better than the pre-fees, right. which is okay. very, very unique and, and rare. Well, just, okay, just remind us of some of the PFS numbers, just so we get sure. context. Sure. So there. it's a large-scale Tier 2 project, 375 million US dollars capital cost, including contingency. And it's, I've always said it's a very honest study. So we've, we've played very few of those games of you know, CapEx into OPEX or yeah. sustaining capital, etc. cetera. Um, so everything is, everything is in that 375 million. Um, the capital intensity is is good. It's sort of mid-range, but we can improve that because being in Namibia, of course, we've got no need yeah. to build a camp, access to infrastructure, etc. So the capital intensity should come down. I think the definitive will 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 show that. Um, it's a standard open pit project, st stock standard uh, processing layout done by Lycopodium, which is a well-known mm. African designer and builder of mines. Right, so we understand the time frame. So we're looking for you know, May, May June on the DFS. It, clearly, you're in conversations with because you made an important point here. You've got to distinguish between the CAPEX and the OPEX. No fun and games. You know, it's very, very, very clear cut. The immediate challenge is dealing with the kind of the CAPEX component. Not, not insurmountable, not, not, not a big number per se. And with the shareholder base, I expect there'll be some interesting conversations going on there. But with the, but I'm going to flip it and say, I want to start with the OPEX bit. Because that, that's, that's really interesting bit to me. 
you may be the beneficiary of a kind of you know fall off on the of inflation, maybe the, the cost of some of the operation, operational components. But what what do you think is sort of the long poles in the tent are? What are the difficulties in terms of the ongoing operations going forward in in the market as as you see it? Operational difficulties? Yeah, yeah. In our case, no real difficulties. I mean, I say that as a mining engineer. Simple, right? um, yeah, ours is super dead simple. It's got no technical issues. We've got right. no metallurgical issues. The geology is very consistent. The real issue here is financial, not operational. And right. by financial, I mean we've got to raise a significant chunk of equity as part of the build. You know, yeah. we've got a $150 million market cap. We've got to raise $350 million. So that's dilutive, whichever way it goes, even if we use a lot of debt, which, by the way, we have progressed. We've got some excellent proposals from various funders. But there is going to be a significant equity component. So, so that represents dilution. How do we deal with it? Right. So, I didn't quite so it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of like, a, OK, that's kind of cost of, cost of capital component in terms of the dilution and the, the debt component will have a cost that. But operationally, you know, yeah. people are starting to you know, talk again to me about a new reality. So whether it be increased costs or, in your case, you know, declining costs, in an increasing gold price environment, do you get to kind of do they? Is there kind of arbitrage between those two things? The, the increasing margins further down the line, given us a big was it hundred? How many ounces? One hundred fifty million dollars. One hundred fifty million, million, market market million right? Well, maybe you actually. It's a good question, but it should be probably be directed at the investors who buy our stock, because our challenge is the fact that we are so undervalued. It represents a huge opportunity for investors and maybe some of your listeners, mm. but it's a challenge for us because of the equity that I mentioned. So how, do, how does that arbitrage mm. translate back into a higher share price? Well, we need investors to come back into the market, and at the moment we're not seeing that. People buying us at the moment are friends and family. Canadian market is still pretty dead, um, and that's got to change. And I mean, if you look at the numbers, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the arbitrage. So on our project, we've got about $600 million of undiscounted cash flow in the first five years. And we value US, and we valued at 120. So, re-rating, capturing that value, mm. that's what we need to do. And th we do that through execution, de-risking, delivering on what we promise. But ultimately, we still need people to buy the shares, and at the moment, that's not happening. Right, and and it's still predicated on whether people believe that you're going to. You're the guys that are going to get this into production or not, because again, you can, you know, the expectation is you got to leave something on the table for an acquisitor, and that they're going to benefit from all of that upside. So, are you going to get this thing into production? Are you the guys? Yes. So um, I'll come back to that. You're 100% right. It's dependent on that. Um, the Canadian market players um, don't care at the moment, um, so they don't believe that we can do it. We can do it. Um, but even if we execute perfectly going forward, as we have done in the past, if we don't get the market traction, then that doesn't help us. And for that reason, the best way to address that, that risk mm -hmm. is to potentially join up with a credible builder and operator of gold mines. So we are interested in that. We think that's a, it's a key strategic option for us, other than the standalone plan. Mm -hmm. But the best way to make that happen is through delivering a credible standalone plan because you cannot force M&A. I do think M&A is a lower risk path to value for companies like ourselves. Yeah. Um, and you know we are obviously active. But tell us what type of M&A because you've got something which is obviously coming up towards DFS, uh, and you've got another project with tw uh, Twin Hills. You've also got large land tract as well, right? So you've kind of got the expiration potential upside. We've seen a lot, of, you know, a bit of M&A recently, mergers of equals that they would like to frame it, but you know, sometimes it's a merger of desperate companies. So in terms of what, what you've got available to you, given that it's Africa and given, the, the, again, the kind of context of where, where you're mining and who's near you, et cetera, are there names that are in conversations with you or are you <laughs> keeping this? You almost got me there. I almost <laughs> let slip. Obviously, I can't. But you're 100% correct. We've got different options. We've mergers of equals, or, or a merger of equals, or maybe a small producer getting together with a developer. Mm. Just the industry's got to get together. There's far too much product. Yeah. Far too many juniors that people don't understand. So we're very open to that. Having said that, I'm a Namibian citizen, proud Namibian citizen, and custody of this project. Put it, pushing this project in the right, right direction is key. And that's why finding the right future owner for this project is key and that's why that's typically in the mid-tier space right. so there are a number of mid-tier companies that that would have an angle certainly some of the west african players who need to diversify away from their jurisdictional risk yeah and growth the materials they, they're out of growth there's no growth that's why they have to buy companies like ourselves and that's why i believe in the end m a will come to us we just have to keep doing what we are crossing the t's and dotting the i's and m a will come 
of course, we're not going to sell the farm for, for nothing. You know, we, um, it's, it's ultimately a conversation around value. Yeah. For me as a CEO of this company, what's the best way to deliver value on my own with somebody else that will come out of these um, discussions and these various options. Okay. What we're doing at the moment is just generating as much of these options as we can. Okay, but timing, timing is key in all of these things. So it's a timing to find success or, or failure. We had a CEO on a couple of weeks ago and he, he was talking about a previous company which he sold for 3.3 billion. Happy hmm. guy, you'd think. But, you know, he ended up from being the, you know, the major shareholder in that thing down to earning less than 0.5% of the company because he had to go and raise the capex. It's a hugely expensive time, potentially, if you don't get that right. He, you know, and I'm talking about his current project. He said, do you know what? I'm getting out of here before we have to raise the capex. I'll put it in position near where you are, DFS. If someone wants to come in at that point, that would be a perfect X point for him. That, no, that's him. He's had a bad experience. I think, I think you're right. You know? you know what Clive Johnson from B2Gold calls it? Suicide by financing. Yeah. So if you finance with very expensive private equity and you right. and you dilute the company away, then that's what happens. In our case, um, yeah, I, I do think there are other ways to finance, but we are yeah. having these discussions with private equity and others. Yeah. But uh, it will be expensive. So therefore, yeah. definitely at the time um, around the definitive study when the project is completely de-risked, permitted, yeah. ready to go, that's usually when these conversations uh, have, uh, take place or, and, and when M&A does happen. Right, and the, the other thing that's happening is, and it happened back in 2011, 12, because I used to be part of it when I was in banking, is that you know, alternative financing was a phrase which came up. A lot of alternative fin financing happening at the moment. We've been speaking to royalty companies. They've had more inbound than they've seen in the last five years because companies, developers, are you know, trying to work out how do I not dilute the heck out of myself and my shareholders and get that bad rap because sometimes it's hard to kind of get out of that dip as, as well. You have managed to get out of a dip recently. Last time we spoke was about you know, 50, 60 cents. You're back over like 110, I think, at, at, at the moment. So markets reacted positively to the news since the PFS and about what you've been talking about recently in terms of advancing the DF, DFS. What are the levers, levers, I've been hanging out with Americans too long, levers have you got available to you bef between now and the end of May, June? So the big one is the delivery of the definitive study because that will bring certainty. Right. It will bring a, cer a certainty in terms of the capital estimate right. and certainty in term further certainty in terms of the technical aspects of the project. So that's huge. Right. That's coming at the end of May. Okay. Thereafter, um, the question of what are you going to do with it? Because now, of course, it can keep on growing. Yes, we will continue to draw. We'll explore and, and you've been infill drilling and yes well, we're doing yeah. all that yes yeah, okay. but the project's got to be put into production it's going to be ready and how will that happen so we've, we've we've been developing what i call the standalone plan earlier so we've advanced all these things like project finance talking to alternative financiers interestingly whilst the equity in canada is not not really available the debt certainly is the alternatives mm. the royalty providers we we have spoken to all of them and we've got some amazing proposals mm. that we are in the process of evaluating. Yeah. So this project can be financed. It's going to be expensive, but it can be financed. Right. Well, then it comes down to margin, right? Do, do you have the margins? Without a doubt. I mean, you look at our um, all its sustaining costs, 940 or what, we're at the bottom of the cost curve. Yeah. Of course, that's going to go up in the definitive, I have to say, because, um, um, you know, the operating cost basis, there have been some, some new, inflation. New reality from so, miners, but, yeah. but still, even if we move up yeah. 10, 15%, we'll still be at the bottom of the cost curve. Yeah. So the margins are there. That's 100% margin with current spot prices. Right. So, I mean, if, if I put spot prices into our valuation model, it's just eye-watering to see the value. That so what does that put you? Because obviously, uh, debt guys are going to go, well, yeah, I can, I can see the margins if this thing gets into production. I'm, get, I'm getting my money back, right? But then the, the equity guys are slightly, I guess, lower risk tolerance because they're... They're playing an equity game, not a debt game. Here is what I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to think. Is how how empowered are you in terms of the negotiations when your margins, your lower cost quartile, probably I would I would, I would say for on, on all and sustaining. Does that allow you to negotiate a 70-30 position versus a 60-40? you know, debt equity. Do, do you know what I mean? Because you know, if the margins look good over here, you get to negotiate a slightly better deal, but you, you, you've used the word expensive twice to me. How are you feeling about Yeah, that? look, I mean, to me, what, what we're hearing from the debt guys is it's about the jurisdiction. So Namibia is high up. Everybody yeah. wants to finance in Namibia. Yeah. It's about the team. We have a good track record. We've done it before. People believe us. We have jurisdiction. We oh, Sorry, we have um, integrity. We've People know that we, we tend to do what we say we'll yeah. do. That counts. And then the quality of the project. That's where costs and these things come in. But um, in the end, the terms, you know, we price takers. Private equity, they want to finance us. Um, it will be expensive, for sure. 
But if you look at the cash generation of this project, um, this debt will be paid back quickly. And that's why I believe that it's better to take um, more expensive debt with less covenants okay. than, than to go to senior banks who are much cheaper, half the cost of capital, but, but a much the, higher equity requirement, hedging, and, and, and that tie you down. And 18 months to get there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. okay, so it's basically get, get into cash flow quicker, but it, the debt may be a little bit more expensive up front. That can be refinanced out as cash flows come, come good. Precisely. Right, okay, in, in, interesting. And how, how are you kind of viewing, we've talked about a little bit of the need for m and you know, we need less projects and bigger bigger projects out there. Um, how are you feeling about the market and where gold price is now? Because clear, the, these sorts of levels, it's like everyone's making money if you're producing gold. Well, you'd hope, um, but is that sustainable? Look, I'm not an economist, so I can venture a view. Um, I do think it's sustainable. I think we are at the beginning of a great innings. I think everybody's been talking about it for a while, but now the gold price is performing. Mm. The sort of financial uncertainty is not going, going to go away. We might be um, at the top end of the interest rate cycle. So it seems like we are set up for the perfect storm, which is good for us. Um, but we need people to come back into the sector. So at the moment, people are sitting in cash. Everybody tells me they're sitting in what the Canadians call GICs, which is money market accounts where you get 5%. There's a huge amount of money sitting on the sidelines, and there needs to be trust. You asked that question, is this sustainable? The market needs to believe that this rally is sustainable. I think then that wave of money will come back into the sector, and I think very quickly you'll see very different valuations in the junior space. Right, and, and with regards to the money that you are talking to, is it kind of conventional? Is it industry? Or are you starting to see company, well, groups, funds, et cetera, which normally sit outside of money coming in and having a look around as well? Um, yes, they call them the generalists. Yeah. Uh, so I just uh, went to BMO, the conference yeah. in February, and there were not many generalists or the ones that were there weren't talking to us. Um, but we raised a bit of money in November last year, mainly in Switzerland. Yeah. So certainly in Europe, funds are, seem to start having inflows again. In Canada, we haven't seen that. Well, you're, in, you're, in, you're an African project, so I think that Europe's always been slightly more comfortable with yes. you know, Africa as, as a jurisdiction, for sure. And in terms of, obviously, Namibia, a great place to do business, easy place to do business. And I meant to ask you earlier, with regards to permanent licensing, et cetera, where are you? Have you got oh, yeah, everything no, you thank need? You. Thank you for that question. Namibia is just heaven. Yeah. And, that's, that, and that doesn't mean that you just get to do things without no. following. And we, we've done things according to IFC, you know, uh, world-class standards, best practice. We did our ESIA, Environmental Social Impact Assessment. We did all the all the components that are part of that. We've been at it for two or three years. We received our mining license. Um, we received our environmental clearance, so the major permits are in place. We do have a couple of um, loose ends to tie up, mm. um, but we have already started um, applying for the site-specific permits. Right. So we are largely permitted. Uh, once we've tied up these loose ends in the next couple of months, we'll be fully permitted. That for a project that was only discovered in 2019, so four years, it's unheard of. And yeah. the reason for that is because both the government and the population in Namibia is supportive, provided you've earned your social license to operate. You've got to do the right thing. You've got to demonstrate commitment to responsible mining and be proactive, Consult. We've done all of that, and that's why people want to see us succeed. And so, it's, yeah, no, we, we we are just about to be fully permitted. Right. So, um, 2023. We we know May, May June for DFS. Um, the end of this year, what would success look like for you? What would you want to have achieved? I think by the end of this year, we want this project to be in early works, meaning that construction has commenced on early okay. earthworks. We want the project to be fully financed and um, with detailed engineering done, long lead orders, orders placed with mm -hmm. a firm timeline to first gold production maybe late in 2025. That would be an ambitious timeline, yeah. but I think it's doable. Good man. Good to see you and nice to see you face to face. Thank, Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.